Our scripture reading this morning is from Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 9. Proverbs 2, 1 through 9. I'll be reading from the King James Version. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply, apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as the silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. It is certainly a delight to see everyone this morning. We are delighted that you're here. I'm particularly glad to be able to celebrate with, with Brady and Morgan and, and Auburn at this great milestone in their lives. And I'm sure, Brady and uh, Morgan and Auburn, you're thinking if I have to pose for one more picture or I have to sit through one more speech, I'm just going to pull my hair out. Well, let me advise you to hold on to your hair as long as you can. There may come a day when you don't have it, and you'd like to have it back, so I wouldn't do that. But there will come a day when you'll treasure those photographs that places you back in a context with people who loved you and spent time with you and wanted the best for you, and you'll uh, desire to look at them often. You'll show them to your children and your grandchildren, and so you'll be glad you have them. And believe it or not, most of those speeches that you've had to sit through, there'll be some truth in those that you'll look back on and say, they had it exactly right. Typically those come from people who have already been there, already experienced those things and look back on it with, with great wisdom. The passage read for us is one of those occasions. Here's a father sending a message to a child, encouraging them to listen carefully. What you see in this passage is kind of the way we need to look at life. And that is, first of all, we have to be aware of what's being said. Sometimes we can audibly hear things, but not really be aware of what's being said. We just kind of want it to be over and move along. As we ponder those things and we become aware of them, somewhere along the way we have to accept them if they're going to be valuable. We have to say, it applies to me. It's something that I need to listen to. It's something that I need to apply to my life. And then there's going to be a value to us. There has to be an application. You see, you spend a lot of years, all of us have when we go to school, we, we spend a lot of years in collecting information and knowledge. Here the wise man is saying, it's important you collect those things. It's valuable, it's like silver. You ought to seek after it. You ought to desire it. Because there's a reason for it. You're going to need it. You're going to need that knowledge. And, but only if it comes with understanding. Now all of us have collected knowledge in areas that we just never used. Because maybe we never really understood it. Or we never really had a, an application in our immediate plans to put it into action. Or maybe... Our life kind of takes a, a course of it on or an unexpected turn and somewhere we find ourselves down the road and we haven't used that we listen to. So it's no longer something we can apply. I can tell you that's true of me with math. Um, I spent a lot of time in math classes and I passed the exams. Some of them barely, but I passed the exams. But I purposely 
tried to find ways not to use it when I got out of school. And guess what? My math skills would be extremely elementary right now because I haven't made application of them. So those things can be okay when you're talking about everyday life or our occupation, our careers, or our vocation, but they become really important when we're talking about spiritual application. There's a passage as you plan for your future, and we're not just talking to, to Brady and Morgan and, and to Auburn this morning, we're talking to all of us. We happen to be honoring them, but there's a quote by Charles uh, Kittering that I found to be interesting. He said, my interest is in the future because I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. That's kind of where we get to on times like graduation, isn't it? We're going to spend the rest of our life there in our future. So as you contemplate that, all of us contemplate that, and you plan for those things, where will that be? In five years, you'll be there. Ten years, you'll be there. In 20 years, you'll be there. But the question becomes, where will you be? You'll be there. It'll be obvious that you have reached that particular milestone in your life, but where is that? You see, that'll be determined by your choices. And that's what the wise man is saying here in this, in this particular Proverbs. Is be aware of where there is going to be. Probably a good example for us to see someone who stayed focused on their goals. And that's really what goals is a, us to have a, a visualization of where we're going to be. And maybe who we're going to be and what we'd like to accomplish. One of those who had to endure a lot of things along the way before he reached that goal is, is the young man Joshua who was very fervent in his service to Moses as someone who spent a lot of time with Moses and helped Moses carry out his work and leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. He and his fellow spies that went into the land, there were 12 of them, and only two of them came back with a good report about the land. It was just like God said it was. There, in that land, it was flowing with milk and honey. And they brought back fruits and evidence that it was just like God said. But also, there were people in the land. <laughs> now, God had told them that too. He told them there were people in the land that they were going to drive out. And so they heard that, but they didn't, weren't really aware of that. And when they saw them, they were physically large people. In their eyes, they were giant people. And these giant people had built walls around themselves. And so 10 of the 12 spies said, we can't do this. We'd rather go back into captivity where we were than to face this obstacle. And yet two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, let us go up at once. You see, their vision was, we want to be there where God promised us we'd be. And the land is just like he said it would be. And God has always been with us, and He will be with us now, and these people be like bread to us. And I share that with you because Joshua wanted to be there. He visualized it. He saw it with his own eyes, and he visualized living there, and his family living there, and, and this being their home like God promised. He could see it clearly. But the other ten could not. And they discouraged enough people who did not trust God and did not see where there was. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation died. But I just remind you of that story because when you get to Joshua chapter 1, Joshua and Caleb, the only two of that generation that lived after those 40 years, and they were still focused on there. 40 years later... Where is there? Very same place. Very same land. And when God speaks to Joshua, now he has not only graduated from being in the school of Moses, but now he's got to take Moses' place. Well, that's sobering, isn't it? 
This is not just to learn and gain knowledge and say, this is, I'd like to be like Moses someday. Who do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I'd like to be like Moses. And God said, you've got to take Moses' place. What an astounding charge. But then God said to him, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. And he said in verse 7 that he was to be strong. Have you heard anything like that in your speeches that you've heard? Have you heard that from your parents? Okay, you know, you're about to go off to college, and here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to remember. And, boy, you've got to, be, you've got to hang on to those things, and, and uh, you've got to be able to make application of those things. So all those things are saying, it's your time. And Joshua was told, it's your time. Now you, this is very poignant, you be strong and of good courage. And you strive to keep my commandments, the commandments that Moses has given unto you. Don't turn to the left hand, nor to the right hand. And he said, and you shall find good success. What are you looking for? What's all the speeches been about? So you can be successful. And boy, they talk about here's the future out there, and it, it's all just waiting on you. Whatever you choose to do, will you find an occupation and go to work and, and start building up your, your plans for life, whether you go to college and get further education, whatever that is, it's waiting for you. But we can't leave out that spiritual application and really benefit and be successful. We have to visualize that what God's promised will be true. For us, that is for those striving to be children of God, for us, we think about what Paul said to the Christians at Koran. See, we have to live, and this is the point. This is what I want you to, all of us to take with us. We have to live with the end in mind. What's the end? To Joshua, the end was the promised land. He wanted to have been there 40 years earlier. He went in there and saw it, just like God said. And he said, God will give it to us. It's ours. That's where we're supposed to be. He didn't get to go in then because others didn't share his vision. Didn't share his goals. Weren't aware of what God promised the way he was. Did not accept that God said it'd be His, and did not make application of those principles. And so when Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians, he reminds them of how important it is for us to stay focused. In fact, in chapter 4 and verse 14, he said, Knowing that He which raised up the Lord shall raise us up by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now listen. For which cause we faint not, for though our outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What do you see? If we're talking about five years or 10 years or 20 years, where is the there? Here's Paul saying, here's where the there is. <laughs> it's an eternal place. Now you're going to experience some things here. That five years and that ten years is, is, is going to be experiences that sometimes will be a challenge. But they're temporal. They won't last forever. But that promise, that eternal destiny, that final goal, you have to visualize. What is it? It's an eternal weight of glory. These are temporal, but that's eternal. This is what he says in chapter 5. 
For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, that being that we are clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that the mortality might be swallowed up in life. There's the ultimate there, isn't it? So we have to live in such a way as to look for the end. What is the end? One of my favorite quotes over the years has been from Philip Nair, who gave you the young men who came to uh, study law. He would ask them questions. You've heard it quoted in different contexts and different venues at different times. But he would ask them questions. He'd say, what did you come here for? And they'd say, to study law. And he would say, if you study law, what do you plan to do with your studies? And they invariably would say, set up a practice of law. That's what we're coming for. We want to practice law. And he would ask them then, and after that, he said, well, then I want to get married and have a family. And after that, and they would say, well, I want to enjoy my home and my work and the fruits of my labor. And he would say, and, and then what? He said, well, I'll hopefully grow old. Inevitably, I'll die. And his final question on the entrance exam was, and then what? You see, he understood, sure. Law is a good practice here. All of us need lawyers from time to time. To go into law practice is an honorable way of life. To want to use that to support yourself and your family is, is understandable. And that's the five and the ten and the twenty years. But ultimately, you have to say, what is the end? If I'm going to live and reach those milestones, as you've reached, reached a, an important milestone in your life of getting your high school diploma, that's huge. That's not easy to do. That takes a lot of hard work. But all that is to focus us on how we're going to use that life. Now, sometimes we have been asked that question so often, we just get numb to it. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? That we really can't grasp when we've grown up. And now we get to make the decision. Now, we get still lots of voices in our years, don't we, about making those decisions. And we can say, well, this is what I'd like to major in. Well, have you thought about this? Well, but I really have an interest here, but boy, you don't know how much money you can make doing that. Well, you know, and we get to keep getting all this advice, but somewhere along the way, we, it dawns on us is, it's got to be my choice. I've got to decide here. And then I've got to accept the responsibilities. If that doesn't turn out so well, then how do I make adjustments? How do I change? And how do I do those things? And that's part of the maturing process. But the question keeps coming back, and then what? And so in our careers, our jobs, what we want to be when we grow up, is inescapably connected to who we are, then it really becomes our vocation. No matter what we choose occupationally, we understand who we are if we're purchased by the blood of Christ. If we're children of His, then everything we do is to glorify Him. Because we know He's preparing a place for us. And we don't want to be like those ten spies and say, Well, I don't know if it's going to be worth it or not. I can tell you it's going to be worth it. And when you have to listen to what the Lord said to Joshua, we need to be strong and of good courage. Not only be aware and visualize what He promised, but accept the terms of it. 
Joshua knew what he had to do. There were still people to fight. Those folks that they saw in the land 40 years earlier, still there. Those walls around those cities, still there. Everything that were obstacles and hindrances are still there. And yet God said, it's yours, Joshua. Now you get your people ready, and you go up and possess the land. That's kind of where you are. And you're in a place that you spend a lot of time as children. Among people who've known you all your life. Have loved you, cared about you. And you're sitting next to parents who invested a lot of time and energy. And I can say, because I've lived on both ends of it, it's difficult as a parent to let go. Now, sometimes the letting go can be gradual, where we just kind of hold on to them and to make sure they're steady, and, and then we kind of let go and make sure they can walk, and, and we're proud to see the accomplishment. Sometimes we can grip a little tight, you know, and, and it makes them unsteady because they're ready to go. And we're holding back, and they lose their balance a little bit. On the other side of it, sometimes as young people, if you're not really aware of this process that God put into place for our care and our direction, as the proverb writer said, incline your ear and apply understanding. Sometimes we get a little anxious to apply the understanding or make application, and, and we jerk away. And that causes our parents to become unsettled. Like, why are they jerking away? All this love and, and all this care and all this advice is for their good. And, and so there's a balance between having learned experience and the proverb writer dealing with that. I read in his word because I have been young and I've been a parent. I read in those words the pleading of a parent. He said, if thou wilt receive my words. It becomes a challenge to us to know that you've got the power to reject our words. You're allowed to do that. When you become grown, you can ignore everything you've been taught by your parents, by your teachers, by your friends. Ignore it all. See, God knew that. Forty Years were spent by people who made that choice. They didn't listen. They didn't care. They weren't aware. They never accepted God's terms, never made application, but they didn't live with the end in mind. It didn't really dawn on them what they'd forfeited it, what they'd given up. But Joshua and Caleb never lost their visualization of that land. They held on to it. And that needs to be what you and I hold on to. Sometimes, probably all of you have experienced this. I experienced this. In high school, most senior classes have a motto of some sort. You get your minds together and you say, here's what kind of describes us. Here's what we've learned together, and this is what we want to remember, and this kind of becomes our voice. My all-time favorite high school motto is, your life is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift to God. That's just profound to me that high school students would say, look, we realize that our life is God's gift to us. And we're not just talking about physical life, being able to breathe and to function. We're talking about our existence. It's God's gift to us. We can live it to His glory and receive His blessings with the end in mind that He has prepared for us an eternal home. That this physical body 
won't last. But the spiritual one will. And so that's his gift to us. And we get to decide what we do with this. And what we do with it. What we do with it becomes our gift to God. We don't often think of it that way, do we? Probably one of the very first passages we ever memorize, if we memorize passages, was John chapter 3 and verse 16. The gift is described. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but listen, but have everlasting life. He's given you a gift, given us a gift. We see that side of it, hopefully. We appreciate that side of it, hopefully. But ah, the gift that we give God is for our decisions to become our vocation. Sometimes we, we use the terminology, what's your calling? Sometimes people mean, you know, God just kind of speaks to them, this is what you're going to do. It's more than that. What talents and abilities and opportunities are unique to you that you can utilize and focus on and give back to God as something you determine to be His? There's two passages in Colossians chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 23 says, Whatever your hands find to do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Sounds like he's saying, look, make sure your gift, you've given some thought. Ever gotten a gift, he thought, they just stopped on the spur of the moment and picked up something. They don't know me. They don't really, they didn't really give me anything that I can use. They just felt like they need to give me something. This is not me, not something I'll ever use. Now what do I do with it? We call it regifting, <laughs> don't we? Somebody else is going to get that gift because it doesn't apply to me. Not something I want. Probably won't be the person you re-gift either, what they want. But you see, when you realize what's been given to you was designed for you, is you. Nobody else like you. Nobody will ever have the opportunities that you have. Nobody else. Now, we have similar things, but nobody will be you. And when you accept that, and you say, this uniqueness that I am, this life that God's given me, I'm going to give back to Him in every decision that I make. How I respond to my parents and their instructions, how will that go and begin my own life independently from my parents, valuing their advice, but independently making application of those things that are right and good because God expects that. And I'll take responsibility then for those things. The other passage from Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, by His authority. What was it that God said to Joshua? Remember the commandments that you received from Moses. Observe them. Make sure you do them. Don't turn to the right nor to the left. And you shall find good success. Everybody has said to you, genuinely, they want you to have good success. There's nobody on the planet that wants you to have good success more than God does. No one. He truly does. You're you. And He wants you to be fully you. But He wants you to recognize how you became you. So five years... When you're there, wherever that is, you're you, just like God wants you to be. And whatever you're doing five years from now, 
in word or deed, you're doing it to His glory, by His authority, in His name. That's how it becomes a calling. That's how it becomes a vocation. Wherever you are 20 years from now, you'll be you. Hopefully you'll be doing what God told you to do. You see, you have to live with that end in mind. Because one day, all of us, this is not just for, for Brady and Morgan and, and Auburn. This is for all of us. Paul said to those Corinthian Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an answer of the deeds done in this body according to that which we've done, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Did you hear that? That's you, isn't it? That's me. Whatever I'm doing now in my body has an end in mind. Because one day, I'm going to stand before God and give an account of what I did. That's not a scary thing if you're being you the way God designed for you to be. And you're making choices, whatever you do in word or deed, you're doing it in His name, by His authority. There is no reason at all to fear that day. You're going to stand before Him and you're going to give an answer to the things you did. And if it's good, guess what? He's going to reward you for being you. Just like He said to Moses, you be strong and of good courage. He's going to say that to you. You be strong and of good courage. You've done the right thing in the right way, for the right reason. That's why it's important. That's why it's so important for us to live our life with the end in mind. There was one occasion where a man was called out of a a comfortable place. The man was called Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, It said when God called him, he went out, not knowing whither he went. You ever get that feeling? Okay. The graduation service is over. You know, all the caps have been thrown up in the air and retrieved and all those things taking place. Now Brother Jerry has made his speech. I think that's the last one we've got to sit through. And so here we are. We've launched out here. This is it. It said of Abraham, not knowing whither he went. God said, you're getting out of your comfortable place. You're going to a place that I'm going to show you. Now, God was going to show him the place. But Abraham hadn't been there. This is a new experience for Abraham. But he went because God directed him. So that becomes the key. You don't know exactly <laughs> where you're going. You've got some plans. You visualize them. But here's what you know and what Abraham knew. If whatever you're doing in word or deed, you're doing by the Lord's authority, you know who you're going with. You're going with the Lord. Abraham knew that. Wherever I'm going, the Lord's going with me. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said, the last thing he did say before he sent it back to the Father, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, listen, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. Here's the key. Here's what we've talked about. Living with the end in mind, teaching them to observe all things which are I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, we don't know what's going to be on tomorrow. We don't know what's five years from now if we're still alive, or ten years. We'll be there. But when we get there, will we be there with the Lord? That's the key, living by His authority. If we are, then we're going to have all of His blessings We can be strong and of good courage. And we can be assured that our time here and our eternal reward there 
will assure our good success. If you hear not a child of God, we've told you in the course of this lesson what the Lord expects. Based upon your faith that Jesus is the Son of God, you're willing to turn away from your sins in repentance with your own lips, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You're willing to submit your life to Him in baptism. You can then arise to walk in newness of life. That new life will be lived with the end in mind. Where Paul said to those Roman Christians, Thanks be to God, we once, we once were the servants of sin, but we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered us. Being then made free from sin, we became the servants of righteousness. That's who we are. That's what we do. If we can assist and help you do that, you let that be known while we stand, while we sing.